Before we actually start the, this talk, I want to say a few words um, to remember our last speaker. The last speaker in our series was uh, before the summer break was in June. And this was Bill Ziemba, who gave us a talk at that time of his travels in Eastern Turkey, Armenia, and so on. And unfortunately, uh, less than two weeks after he gave this talk, uh, Bill passed away. And so we were fortunate to have uh, listened to him. And we, I think we did hear his final presentation that he's made. And uh, he was apparently quite appreciative of the opportunity to talk to our group. Um, so I just wanted to uh, say these words and to remember uh, Bill, who gave us two talks during the last uh, year. So I'm going to now go on to uh, talk about our experiences with a trip to Vietnam and Cambodia. It was called Viking Magnificent Mekong, using the Viking uh, uh, the cruise ship line, it was a river boat. And we did this in October, end of October into November 2016. It was two weeks long. And uh, I traveled at that time, let's see if I can get this to move, with my uh, wife, Edie, whom you can see here, my brother from Barbados and his wife. So the four of us traveled together. And the main reason for doing the trip, the highlight was to go to Angkor Wat, which you see in the background of this particular picture. But here's what the trip involved. We started in Hanoi and there's a land portion here. We then flew from Hanoi to Siem Reap in Cambodia, which was a starting off point to visit Angkor Wat. Then we visited a number of temples here, as you'll see. And when we went by road to get to Kampong Cham, where we boarded our riverboat uh, that took us down the Mekong River, Phnom Penh, and then into Vietnam to Tan Chau, Sadek, Maito. And finally, we went with a short bus ride to reach uh, what is now Ho Chi Minh City, which used to be Saigon. During this trip, we heard a lot about recent history, both from professional speakers, from the guides, and so on. So, you know, I make a bit of sense to go through this very quickly. But in the 1880s, the French were in Indochina, and uh, formed Indochina after the Sino-French War. And they continued in power until the mid 1950s, when they lost control over Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam at the end of what we then call the Indochina War. Vietnam at the time was divided between the North and the South with the idea that they were going to have elections two years after this in 1956. The elections never occurred. And what we heard on the trip was that everybody expected that Ho Chi Minh, who was in the North, was going to win these elections if they had them, and DM in the South I guess supported by the Americans decided not to hold any elections. And this led to what in North America is called the Vietnam War. In Vietnam is what is called the American War. And in January, 1973, there was an agreement to end this war. Uh, the Americans left except for some technicians at the CIA, but the war continued until April the 30th, 1975, when Saigon fell. And that was the end of the war and the reunification of Vietnam between the North and the South. So that's the basic background of time period that we'll hear a lot about during our trip. So we started in Hanoi. I walked out of the hotel with Edie and we went for a stroll in the afternoon. And the first thing that struck me is the motorbikes. Everywhere there were motorbikes. Here motorbikes just coming at the beginning of the green light on the top left, and then in a small side street. And the small side street, when you want to cross them, there are no traffic lights. And so you just step out into the road, the motorbikes go around you, and you just keep walking. And I'll show you an example of that. <laughs> So 
you saw that lady cross the road across all the motorbikes, and we learned to do the same thing. And you put aside your fear and you just keep walking and the bikes go around you. The next morning we were taken by Viking on a tour of uh, uh, Hanoi. And we were taken first to this Ho Chi Minh mausoleum. And inside this mausoleum lies uh, the body, embalmed body of Ho Chi Minh. But we were there at the end of October. Uh, you're normally allowed to go inside, but there is nobody there, nobody in of Ho Chi Minh at the end of October because the body goes to Russia in October, November to get fixed up a little bit more and comes back to Vietnam to be left there in this mausoleum. We visited the presidential palace. This was built by the French in the early 1900s. And Ho Chi Minh refused to live in this palace. He does entertain guests here. He preferred to live in this little hut, as it were, the two-story building on the left-hand side. But it's in a large estate with a lake or a pond. Mind you, he had a, a Rolls Royce and a couple of other fancy cars in the garages there. So he wasn't living like a pauper by any means. We were taken to visit this temple of literature. And you will see on the left-hand side at the bottom, these young ladies dressed up in long gowns. What is that for? Well, it turned out that we were there just at the end of the school year. And so people would come to this temple of literature, the high school graduates, get their photographs taken in fancy clothes. As you can see, the boys, the girls, all dressed up very fancy. Inside this uh, complex of the Temple of Richard is the Temple of Confucius, and you'll see a portrait of Confucius on the right hand side with all the offerings brought to him. Close by, we were taken to the Museum of Ethnology, and the Museum of Ethnology has buildings representing all the different parts of Vietnam, and they have a number of these tomb houses uh, with these uh, sculptures that are on the outside, these are wooden sculptures. And very typical of what we saw there with these sculptures with a lot of things to do with fertility, as you can see here. Uh, Vietnam is famous for its water puppet show, the Hoi Hoi Mok, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, show. And we were treated to one of these water puppet shows as a little battle, uh, sea battle reenacted by puppets. We were taken to the Maison Centrale, it used to be called the Hoa Lo Prison, nicknamed the Hanoi Hilton. And this is where John McCain spent uh, a few years of his life after he was captured. It's now a museum and we were able to go inside. And in the museum, you'll see uh, guillotines and various things representing uh, captivity, torture and so on. A little propaganda, which I thought was interesting. As thousands of planes were shot down and hundreds of United States pilots were arrested by the North Army and people. Some of them were imprisoned here. During the war, the national economy was having difficulties, but the Vietnamese government created the best living conditions that they could for the US pilots. They had a stable life during their temporary detention periods. I understand it wasn't quite like that, but this is what you see on the wall of the museum. And then we had some free time to walk around close to our hotel. It was this little lake in the center of Hanoi called Hoang Kiem Lake. And it's always nice to see what the local people are doing, just hanging out, selling some things. You notice a typical Vietnamese hat on this lady uh, with her baskets that she has. That's very typical. And around this lake area, on every weekend, they close all the roads to cars and pedestrians only allowed from Friday after, late afternoon until Sunday midnight. And all the young, a lot of young people come down there and they do all of these fun activities for them, skipping rope, tug of war, fights. And in the evening, they sit there playing guitars and singing. It's all very, very pleasant to just walk around and see what's going on. Our hotel is in the building just behind us, uh, uh, behind this square. 
we walked out to coming back to the hotel. There were three different couples, looked like they were married couples, getting photographs taken at the same place. And so we asked people, what is going on? Well, they don't get the photographs taken after the wedding. They get the photographs taken about a month before the wedding because there's so much to do at the time of the wedding and after the wedding that getting photographs have to be done at another time. So these people are not married yet. They're just dressed up like they're married and they're getting the photographs taken in advance. And in the same square, here's a doggy daycare. People who have dogs and like to take them to daycare. And then walking the little streets is always that uh, interesting. Every street is like a market. People are selling things everywhere. Uh, and here are the balancing two of these uh, baskets on her shoulders, her hat's off. Somebody comes up on a motorcycle, buy some dragon food on the side of the road, buy flowers. Here is that uh, people sitting on the side of the road, they're just playing chess, it's Asian chess, they're playing on the side of the road. Some school kids, uh, uh, two different schools, come to have an after, afternoon snack after school. This little girl was left on her father's motorcycle. His father went in to buy something and she's just having a drink. And people are selling and cooking and eating all on the, all the sidewalks. And here the lady is uh, preparing food uh, to be cooked. People are just sitting there eating with the motorcycles all around, cars going up and down the streets. And one of the specialties of the area is something called egg coffee. Well, I didn't try it. The only part of egg coffee that I would enjoy was the 12 ounces of espresso. I didn't think I wanted an egg yolk or four tablespoons of sweetened condensed milk mixed into my coffee. And therefore I declined the opportunity to try this uh, type of coffee. I instead had espresso. You have a lot of motorcycles on the roads, and here's a motorcycle parking lot. It's on a sidewalk, but you have to pay for your spot. Somebody supervises, and people pay to have a parking spot here. So from Hanoi, we then flew to Cambodia to Siem Reap. And Viking, in their arrangements, makes it so it's very easy for you when you arrive at the new place. It's all looked after. You swept through uh, all the formalities of immigration very rapidly. And they put you up at very nice hotels. It's part of their package. It's a Sofitel in Siem Reap. There's also a Sofitel at uh, the other places that we went in Hanoi and eventually in Saigon. And we had dinner and we had a show, uh, a show Cambodian type of show. And I just want to show you one uh, aspect of the show, and it's these dancers called Apsara dancers, and you'll see why in a few minutes. But remember this picture, I'll show it to you again shortly. So next day we're off to Angkor Wat, and here is Angkor Wat from the outside. It's a, a very important and huge structure. It is the largest religious structure in the world. It's 4,250 by 5,000 feet for those who can still think in feet. It is surrounded by a moat that's 600 feet wide. It was built in the 12th century AD by one of the kings at the time, at the height of the Khmer Empire. And at that time, the Khmer Empire comprised not only what is now Cambodia, but also all of Thailand into Laos, and even down into uh, the southern part of Thailand, going toward Malaysia. Inside the temple grounds, very elaborate uh, ornamental, ornamented buildings, as you can see here. I won't bore you with one after the other, just a few pictures of the type of uh, construction that they have in the buildings there. But here are some carvings on the wall in the temple of Apsara dancers. You will see that that's what they're trying to mimic in their show. 
that they provided for us. Same thing that they had back in the uh, 12th century in their carvings. There are Buddhist monks in the, in the temple. Modern Buddhist monks with their cell phones in hand. But there's more to Siem Reap than just in that area than just Angkor Wat. There are many, many temples. This is one of the more beautiful temples called the Bhante Shre, Citadel of Women or Temple of Women. It's a Hindu temple, not a Buddhist temple. And it's dedicated to Shiva uh, and Parvati, actually. Shiva is here, right in his bowl. Parvati was behind him, but her head has been knocked off. That was Shiva's wife, one of the Hindu gods. gods. Beautiful entranceway in, within the temple complex. And one of the sad, somewhat sad, but also interesting things and uh, uplifting things to see was there were, as you exited the temple, there was a group of people playing music and obviously like buskers. All of these people are missing a limb or part of a limb from being on landmine injuries. There are so many people who've been damaged by landmines in the area. And these people got together, like this person here, without his uh, hand, uh, to make music. And I thought that was nice to see. Here's another temple complex. There's a terrace of elephants, and you can see the whole wall has got carvings of elephants. Add them up a bit closer, you can see people riding the elephants. Very elaborate. And then into the town of Siem Reap, away from the temples, typical small streets, tut tuts, which were present everywhere that we travel in this area. Someone waiting for to get a ride, to take somebody on a ride. And that's how we got from our hotel to Siem Reap by using a tut tut. And for me, it was nice to see things like coconuts, which I see a lot of where I come from originally in Barbados, pineapples, all the tropical fruit here. And then there was a, a market, the main market in Siem Reap, which is a covered market. And in the covered market, you can buy uh, fruit. These are sugar apples, we call them in Barbados, uh, on the right-hand side. But you can have all kinds of things done in the market. Here is a hairdressing salon. That's sitting open in the market. You get your hair done. Uh, no cubicle or anything. You're just fully exposed to everybody else. And on the street, uh, we came back in the evening, past this uh, fish spa. This is Dr. Fish Massage. Have you ever gotten the super clean feet by Dr. Fishy? Don't miss this unique experience. Please feed our hungry fish your dead skin. If you want your feet to feel like baby's bottom, please do it now. If our fish cannot make you happy, we will not charge. They charge about $2 for a session. My brother and his wife decided to try it out. As you can see, uh, they're giggling all the way. Uh, apparently, it was very tickly to have the fish pick your skin uh, and smoothen out your skin. On the following day, we went to another temple, temple called Taprom Temple which the buildings are a little bit in disrepair because nature has started to take, take over. You can see the trees are growing out of the remnants of the temple. And this particular temple was used in the, in the movie Tomb Raider, where Angelina Jolie here, you can see a picture from the internet, uh, was at this particular temple. So a lot of people like to go there and have the picture taken and pretend they're in this, like in this movie. Another temple is the Bayon Temple, and this one has 54 towers represented the 54 provinces of Cambodia, and each tower has four smiling Buddhas, one on each side of uh, the, the, the uh, tower. And this is just one of many ruins in what we call Angkor Thom, the great city, which is where Angkor Wat is within the ancient Khmer Empire. And here you can see a better picture of the Buddhas on 
one one uh, vista of that from Taos, and from the side of Thailand Buddha. And then I will show you a picture on the right. This is our guide. His name was Sky. And he's a very interesting person because Sky uh, gave us his history. He lived through the terror of Pol Pot and the purges that went on at that time. And he was in a camp. He was a kid at the time. And he assisted his family in getting food by catching rats, insects, and he said he became what was considered a champion rat catcher. And that's how he helped his family to survive. And even in those times, he said he had to do it somewhat secretly because the authorities did not approve of people getting extra food in any way, even catching rats and insects. Sky was uh, told us that a number of kids that you'll see asking for handouts, please do not give them anything. Um, these kids should be at school. The reason that I have this job, which is a very good job for someone in Cambodia, is because I went to get some education. I learned English, and that gave me an in into the tourist industry. Do not encourage the kids to stay out of school. Please do not give them any handouts. This is an interesting person. One of the things that Viking uh, did was to make sure that we got to hear from some of these local people and the guide on tour bus B came on our bus just to tell us his life story, which was somewhat similar. So we learned from Sky quite a bit about what went on during Pol Pot's reign. So I'll bring you to a little bit of Cambodian history and talk about Pol Pot because we're going to see some more of what he ended up doing. But in 1953, he said Cambodia won independence from France. They had a king, King Sihanouk, and it became the Kingdom of Cambodia. In 1965, Sihanouk allowed the North Vietnamese guerrillas to set up bases in Cambodia during the Vietnam War and use what became called as the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which I'll show you a picture of shortly. In 1969, the U.S. began a secret bombing against North Vietnamese forces on Cambodian soil coming through this trail. This was not approved by the U.S. Uh, Congress. This was done in secret. And here is the Ho Chi Minh Trail. It starts off in Hanoi, in North Vietnam. Here's the demilitarized zone between North and South Vietnam. Went through Laos and then through this little part of Cambodia into South Vietnam. And this is the part that the Americans were partly bombing, this part here. And this brings us to Pol Pot. He was actually born to an affluent family in a village in 1925. He went to university in Paris, to the University of Paris called the Sorbonne also. And there he became a communist. He came back to Cambodia in 1953 and he joined the Communist Kampuchean People's Revolutionary Party, or KPRP. He eventually became leader of that party. There was a clampdown by the king or communist in Cambodia, and that forced his party and him into the jungle. The Khmer Rouge, which is the Communist Party of Kampuchea guerrilla army, uh, was formed. And the Khmer Rouge troops increased dramatically when the U.S. started bombing the Ho Chi Minh Trail. When the U.S. left Vietnam in 1973, the Khmer Rouge uh, came into Phnom Penh on April the 17th, 1975. And during our trip, we had a history talk and we showed photographs, videos of the Khmer Rouge entering Phnom Penh. And the people were cheering, they were happy, they were liberated by this party. The next day, Paul Pot and his party said, everybody have, has to leave. Everybody leave Phnom Penh, going into detention camps, uh, into collective farms and things of that nature. So he evacuated Phnom Penh, back to Marxist principles, no industry. He killed all the educated people and all of his perceived enemies. About 2 million people were killed, 25% of the population at the time. He even 
invited people, expatriates, to come back to Cambodia to rebuild Cambodia. When they came back, because they had education, he killed them. And then he made a mistake and started to attack Vietnamese border, border villages. And in the end, the Viet Vietnam invaded Cambodia, entered Phnom Penh in January of 1979. Pol Pot was defeated. He then lost control of the Khmer Rouge and he died in the jungle in April of 1998 in house arrest by the Khmer Rouge's own old party. The current leadership of Cambodia, for your interest, there's still a king, the head of state, the king, King Norodom Sihamoni, since October 2004. The government is led by the Cambodian People's Party, previously called the KPRP. This is the Communist Party that was existing that formed the Khmer Rouge. They're still, they're now in power, and they've been in power since 1979. They changed from socialism to free market economy in 1991. The current prime minister, Hun Sen, has been prime minister since 1985. He has all the seats in the National Assembly and all opposition parties are banned. So it is a autocracy. It is not a democracy at this point in time. So that's where we are in Cambodia. So uh, we visited a school that's sponsored by the Viking Company. And they like tourists, uh, the visitors, to go to the school and help teach the children English, to interact with the children, the students there. So we did. We went into the class where we were talk to, talking about English vocabulary and translation into Cambodian language. And it's all done by road. It's not like modern education at all. And as you drive around, as we drove around back in our buses, we passed these stalls on the side of the road and had them stop because they were rather interesting things to see. And they were like deep fried crickets and scorpions and larvae and variety of things that looked like they could be good to eat, could be crunchy anyhow. Here you can see some close up of some larvae, all deep fried, some crickets on the top and some scorpions at the bottom. So we were told not to buy stuff at these kind of stores. And eventually at the Viking people created for us a Cambodian dinner and appetizers before dinner, which they said was safe for us to eat. And here's my sister-in-law trying some tarantulas, which we had. They were yummy, they were crunchy. Um, and we actually saw an American, Cam a Cambodian living in America, buy about three kilos of these. He had to take back to San Francisco where she was living. Apparently, you're allowed to bring them back into the United States. And, you know, from uh, Siem Reap, we took a bus and went uh, now to Kampong Cham to get to the river. And we saw lots of things on the road. Here is a guy. Uh, he has his own uh, shop on his on his bicycle or motorbike, riding along with a little trailer with all the things to sell. People selling fruit on the side of the road. This young lady is uh, popping rice, uh, not popping corn, but cooking rice in a wok until it pops. And we tried some of that. I think popcorn is better. It was kind of dry, didn't have much taste, but it's different. We went to a rubber plantation, saw how they collected the sap from uh, the, the cuts in the tree, as you can see on the right hand side. And we stopped at Kampong Cham, Twin Holy Mountains, also called Phnom Cross. And this is one of two, two temples, the Twin Temple. And um, Mary was talking about monkeys at Angkor Wat. Well, there sure were enough monkeys here at this uh, Kampong Cham temple, as you can see, a whole group of them. And we have the uh, uh, cobra head, uh, Naga motif. I'm just going to stop now and confirm. Richard, you are recording, correct? Good. <laughs> and this yes, I am. Thank you. This motif that you can see here, you can see here this statue of Buddha. Buddha is sitting on a cobra rolled up, and the head of the cobra 
is covering the Buddha. And so we see this type of motif in many Buddhist uh, temples. And here, is, 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 is. this temple has lots of things to do with the Buddha. Buddha with his disciples, massive uh, sculptures, as you can see, relative to my uh, brother and sister-in-law. The, the statue here at the front is just a little less than life size, so you can appreciate how big this lion Buddha has to be. And here is a happy Buddha. And here was a stupa, a Buddhist shrine, all covered in gold. And then we looked inside, and it's a little bit horrific. Inside, they're just cows. And these are all part of the killings of Pol Pot that are shown here in this shrine. We went into Kampong Cham Market. I love to walk through markets, so when I have any free time, I do that. Again, the motorcycles everywhere, but interesting. All kinds of interesting things to see for sale. The chickens with the eggs in them. That I, we, used, we used to have our own chickens when I was a kid growing up in Barbados. And when we killed our own chickens, we'd ha often have eggs like these in them. The cooked chickens, clams. Here are some cooked, skewered fish, eggs. And we went into the market there. And here's this lady, a beautiful young lady. And she's happily cutting away at meat. She is like a butcher in the market. And she was quite happy to have me stay there and take photographs while she did her work. And there has to be somewhere you can buy your motorcycle. So that's a motorcycle shop. All types of motorcycles to buy. Well, we reached our boat, our ship. And this is the ship that we went on. And it only had 28 cabins, so it could hold a maximum of 56 passengers, two people in a cabin. And I told you, we had educational sessions on the ship by different professors. Much of it had to do with recent history, particularly to do with uh, um, the Vietnam War, Pol Pot, and so on. And then we were taken to experience many different cultural experiences, both on the ship and off the ship. We were showing movies that were related to Vietnam and Cambodia. So we went on the ship then from Kampong Cham into the main Bikong River down toward the southern part of Vietnam. And going down the Mekong River, it's interesting to see the little boats, fishing boats mainly, here at the side of the road, or side of the river, I should say. And we were taken to a little village, this was Chongko village, where they made their own cotton. As you can see here, different colored thread and they're weaving it together to make this pattern. And they use this then to make different things for use. So the typical Cambodian scarf called a crama is made out of this type of cotton. And you can see the lady at this village is wearing one, you can buy them. Woman, the lady on the right wearing a different type of scarf, but all made from this type of cotton material. We saw them doing like a beaten type of uh, copper, um, in, uh, not a painting, but a uh, picture onto this metal object. By the side of the road, there was a school room. It was open to the air on all sides. It had a little catch roof on top of it. Again, you can see it's Thursday, November the 3rd, 2016. Do you remember what happened on uh, November with number November the 5th, 2016? This was the US presidential election happened I, I, that or the following week. We were there at the time when Trump was uh, voted into power. In any case, these are the little kids. Uh, and they're learning English again, colors. This lady is a teacher, one of the kids and a teacher. Now, 
teachers are not teachers the training that we are accustomed to have. They don't go to teach and learn education or school like that. If you can speak English, you can be a teacher and teach English because all the teachers were killed. So these are the new crop coming up and just starting up again and starting to learn. And the educational system is really a difficult situation. On one day, uh, we were taken to experience a different type of transportation on an ox cart. So at Kampong village, also called uh, Trolach, we went on to these ox carts. Here is Edie and I on the ox cart. You can see the hat that this man is, uh, uh, hat this man is wearing. It's not like a Vietnamese conical hat. This is typical Cambodian hat. And here are the ox in the, behind us. Pass a rice paddy. They grow quite a bit of rice there in that whole area. And then we stopped here at this village to then go on to a bus to a temple. But there were lots of little kids playing. And this little girl came right up to the road in a little tree to look at us, or at these tourists, which I quite enjoy seeing her. And then we went to this big Buddhist center, the kingdom of Cambodia called Udon Monastery. It's very, very fancy, very full of gold everywhere. And we were going there to be blessed by the monks as part of uh, our visit to this uh, temple. You can see the Naga motif again, like the snake, the cobra, and the Buddha sitting there covered by the on the cobra coil, but there are also flowers and butterflies, things other than just in the temple. And then we went inside the main hall, and this is where the monks and the nuns um, would have their meals. The bell rang, and these monks started to come toward the, the, the lunch area. The nuns had fed themselves first, they ate by themselves. And then they come together to help feed or give food to the monks. And these are two Buddhist monks who are going to bless us, give us a ceremony with a uh, Buddhist blessing. And we were told, you have to dress appropriately when you come on this tour. And what does appropriately mean? Well, the main thing that they said was for women, women must not wear bow wow shirts. What are Bow Wow shirts? Well, when you come before the monks, you're supposed to bow, and you don't want to wear a shirt that when you bow, the monks say, wow. So that's what you're not supposed to wear. So we got our blessing, and then we came back and we went to the royal palace. Again, quite an elaborate building, big, beautifully manicured grounds. And I went on our free time to the market. This is the central market. This is the closed part of the market. And all kinds of stuff are there. And I show you, this is looking in one of the cases there. You can buy any type of watch that you want, any brand that you care to have to, sitting there. That's all clustered together. If you walk on the street, again, you get all of these interesting things to see. This, girl is a saleswoman and she was selling these eggs which were cracked on one side and these are fertilized eggs that have been boiled, cooked already, with little embryos inside them, they're called balut. You can get chicken or you get duck one, I did not try that. And we were taken to experience a bicycle rickshaw. They wanted to make sure that we had all different transportation that they had available there that we were able to try out except we didn't go on motorcycles. So we're being driven around by a bicycle rickshaw. And in this way, we were taken to the Tuol Slang Detention Center. We come to probably the most uh, difficult and sad part of this journey, because this detention center used to be a school. And you'll see here, it's now a museum. It was one of the secondary schools in the capital. 
And after Pol Pot came, he transformed it into a prison called S21, Security Office 21, which is the bigger in this Kampuchea Democratic Republic. And it was surrounded with a double wall of corrugated iron surmounted by dense barbed wires. So you go, this is school rooms that we can see behind a barbed wire and you can go inside, you can still see it's a classroom. You can see the black board or green board on the wall and they've divided the school room into little uh, cubicles. And they have these rooms where they put people, chain them and torture them. And here are some of the signs uh, that they translated from Cambodian to what the prisoners had to obey. Answer my question, don't turn them away, don't try to hide the facts, don't tell me anything, just add, don't waste any time. But more importantly, while getting lashes or electrification, you must not cry at all. Do nothing, sit still and wait for my orders. If there's no order, keep quiet. When I ask you to do something, do it right away. If you don't follow all the above rules, you shall get many lashes of electric wire. If you disobey any point of my regulations, you will get either 10 lashes or five shocks of electric discharge. So this is what went on there. And next to it, the close by is what is called the killing fields. It's the genocidal center. It's now a museum. And we walk through the killing fields and these depressions are where there were mass graves where people were buried. Most sad to me was this tree, which had all of these uh, adornments, but was a killing tree against which executioners would beat children until they died. And they have a stupa also, a big stupa there. It's filled with skulls. And here they even have labels with little different colors telling you how the people were killed because most of them were not shot because they wouldn't waste bullets. That would be a waste. Kill him by an iron tool, evidence of killing by a hoe, kill him by an ax, kill him by a hook knife, neck cutting, and so on. And this is what you will see there. So that's the gruesome part of this trip. Um, that's, our, that's the history of this uh, part of the world, unfortunately. So we left Cambodia, went down the river, and we're back in Vietnam. <coughs> and we were taken in a sampan, the Tan Chau, down the river. Now you see the Vietnamese style hats that the lady is wearing. Vietnamese uh, working in the fields. This little boy had an unusual haircut. And here he is on the right with his sister. And apparently the reason for this haircut is that he was unwell when he was much smaller. And the medicine man basically said, you need to cut his hair in this fashion and leave it like that until he reaches a certain age and that will help cure him from what ails him. We passed a, a number of fish farms and this is one of the farms going to tilapia that we often get here. There's a lot of dredging going on. They're dredging the uh, silt at the bottom of the uh, river, put it into these barges, and they use it for building material. And the barges get really full. And if you look closely, you can see there's a guy here, and he's actually walking on the barge, but that part of the barge is actually underwater. A lot of people fish in the river, fishing nets here to go behind the houses. And then one evening we saw a movie called Lamont, The Lover, and it was set in part in Sadek, which is where we visited the following morning. And this house that you can see here was one of the buildings that was used in that movie, which is why they showed us the movie the night before. Interesting marketplace. Beautiful uh, sales lady. All kinds of rice that you can buy here, going anywhere from 45 cents to $1.40 Canadian per kilo. And here this lady came off her motorcycle. She's buying something. 
look at it closely. On the left, she was what she's buying. They're called long-tailed chickens, euphemistically. They're rats grown specifically for the food market. And that's what she was buying. You can buy frogs. Here they're skinned already. Beetle nuts. This lady is making a beetle nut for chewing. You take the nut, you cut it up, you put some edible lime on a leaf. Uh, you put the cut up nut inside there, fold it over, and you have a thing to chew on. We were taken to the factory that made these bricks that you can see here. The interesting thing about the factory is that the fuel that they use for lighting the fires to, to make these bricks, shown here, a rice husk. And that's what they burn to, to uh, heat up the ovens. And here is someone bringing rice husk to the factory to be used <coughs> on this little sampan. The area was Catholic, of course, it was run by the French, so there are lots of Catholic churches around still. Here we were taken to a place where we could meet with some snakes, either real, which you can hold, or here marinating in some rice wine, and you can then try the wine, which my sister-in-law and I both tried, the others declined, but it, to me, it just tasted like rice wine. It didn't taste, I couldn't taste a snake. But there you are. And we disembarked our ship at my toe. So this is the ship we were on. But, uh, and uh, from there, we took a bus and we went across the countryside toward Ho Chi Minh City. But before we got there, we went to the Kuchi Tunnels, where we were met by what looked look like a Viet Cong soldier in the old Viet Cong garb. And he took us on a tour of the tunnels. And we were allowed to go into these tunnels. And there were many hundreds of kilometers of these tunnels throughout this area. He took us to this area and big area full of leaves on the ground and said, can anyone see the entrance to the tunnel here? And we couldn't find it. But we have two shoes here. We're looking at what was the entrance to the tunnel. And he lifted it up. Here we are. Uh, and when he's ready, he went into the tunnel. And then he covered a piece of wood with leaves again and put it back down. And the opening was closed. Can't see it anymore. And while we were looking at this, he popped up somewhere else. So the Americans fighting in this area had a really difficult issue because people were going underground through these tunnels, popping up wherever they felt like popping up. Difficult to find them. And this is the jungle around where they were walking, trying to go through this area, and people were popping up everywhere. Anyhow, we finally reached uh, Ho Chi Minh City, and we were taken to Reunification Palace. It used to be called the Independence Palace before the fall of Saigon. And this is where uh, the People's Army of Vietnam, Vietnam uh, and the Viet Cong received the surrender of the South Vietnamese forces, April the 30th, 1975, in this room. And the war ended when two tanks, one number 843, which was a Soviet made tank, and tank number 390, a Chinese-made tank, crashed through the gates of the palace to take over the palace and end the war. And we were told that school children, part of their curriculum was to learn about this and they needed to know the numbers on these tanks as part of their education, because it was very important to them. And they're very proud about what happened. And this uh, ex- Viet Cong soldier here with a tank uh, on one of these tanks. And he liked to be there to show and talk about his tank. This other guy, very serious fellow, also with the other tank. Ho Chi Minh City now, the very modern city, built up skyscrapers, beautiful architecture. Look at it, modern. And everywhere you walk around now, 
You see Ho Chi Minh, Uncle Ho, they call him. Here he is outside City Hall, which is a French colonial style design. Here's Notre Dame Cathedral, another remnant uh, Catholic church. The train station outside, inside Ho Chi Minh again, pictured there, colonial building. There's an opera house. And many of you may be familiar with this iconic photograph here um, of the fall of Saigon. This is a picture taken of people trying to get on the last helicopter out of Saigon. This is the building from the other side, taken from the other side. It wasn't a big office tower when this picture was taken in 75. And while we were there, we had to visit, uh, uh, have lunch at this place called Pho 2000. This restaurant was famous because um, President Clinton and his daughter had Pho at this particular restaurant when they visited. So we thought we should have lunch at the same restaurant and have Pho. So we did. And as we leave um, Ho Chi Minh City, just like North Vietnam, Motorcycles everywhere waiting at the red light. So a few things about the trip as I conclude. One of the things that Viking did, which I thought was wonderful, is um, we, we went on many, many tours and met many people who we would normally wish to tip. And they wouldn't know how much to tip, what currency and so on. So Viking said, Tip as usual on the ship. When you leave the ship, settle up, leave your tip. But for off the ship, what we would recommend is that you give us a certain amount of money. I don't think it was much, maybe $100. We will look after tipping everybody who needs to be tipped during your tour. You don't have to think about it anymore. And that's what we did. And I thought that was great for this type of trip. If you go with Viking, currently the ship we're on no longer is with Viking. They built their own ship called the Viking Saigon, launched this year. It's slightly bigger, carries 80 guests, built specifically to go on the uh, Mekong River. And there is a picture of it. You can still do a magnificent Mekong trip. I looked it up, October to November, 2023, 15 days, Viking Saigon from about 9,000 to 10,000 Canadian. The veranda at 10,000 are all sold out for these, all the trips in October and November of 2023. If you want a veranda, they're totally sold out currently. So you have to look at 2024 if you want a veranda. And they have uh, special airfares. And this is the picture taken from our hotel room at night. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to try and answer any questions that you might have. I'm going to stop sharing. Share. Stop sharing. Oh. There we are. Thank you so much. Somebody has a question. Uh, could you unmute yourselves if you're going to ask a question, please? or make a comment. Beverly, unmute yourself, please, and ask a question. I see your thumb, your yes. a hand up. I wasn't, wasn't intending to ask a question, just simply uh, saying that, uh, that I enjoyed your talk, that's all. I thought, I thought I gave you the thumbs up, but I, maybe I took the wrong thing. Thank you. Thank you. And Paul Harrison, I see a hand up in the air there. You'll need to unmute yourself. Paul, it's just a, it was just a clapping thank you for the presentation. Oh, okay. Very interesting, thank you. <laughs> Paul, we're heading off to uh, Vietnam in November. How, did you need a visa to get into Vietnam? Um, and if you did, did you do it online or did you go down to the embassy? Yeah, I did it online. It was quite easy to do. I can't remember all the details now because it was a while ago, but I know we did it online. We paid and, something so everything uh, we, was looked after. Uh, we paid extra 
uh, with the online application so that we got that we got priority when we got there. And when we got there, somebody was there with our name, meet at met us, give me your passport. Just sit there, we'll come back with your passport and everything stamped, which is what happened. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, the one that says Priscilla Greenwood. Yes, I'm I'm Corky. You showed the uh, water puppet show. How did that, how did they move the puppets? I don't know how they moved the puppets because the puppets were all in the water. But you know what? I think that they were behind the screen with long poles under the water and manipulating them from behind that screen under the water. That's as best as I would think they were doing, because they couldn't be in the water. They weren't in the water. Uh, I... Mary, uh, you need to unmute. Unmute, is that it? Yeah. Okay, I wasn't sure how it worked, but I did some uh, many of the same things, just in different locations. Uh, we did go up to Halong Bay, too, and got on a boat which was quite spectacular, just north of uh, Hanoi. We were up in Hanoi. So, but it is a wonderful country. I was, on, I was with Road Scholar. With Road Scholar? R-O-A-D Scholar? Road Scholar? Have you ever heard of it? No. Well, road scholarship, R H O D E S. No, I, not that roads. Like, like road down the road. R O A D. It's a company, and we did go by boat part of the way from Chow Dock up to Siem Reap, but we um, mainly were on boats and uh, other transportation. I mean, um, so we got, but we went to the killing fields and to the tunnels, and we walked in the tunnels and everything. I mean, crawled in the tunnels, but it was just different locations. You we were a little further south than where we were. We were up in the main part of Cambodia, spent more time there. A place called Chow Dok. Well, would you mind if I ask Mary uh, to just comment a little more on Rhodes Scholars? When we were in um, Canadian Arctic and Greenland recently, there was a contingent of Rhodes Scholars on the same cruise that we were on, and we were told that it is the successor to Elder Hostel, or maybe I misunderstood and it's just kind of similar. But they were given, you know, preferential treatment at some places. They had reserved seats on the charter airline and so on. What, what was your experience and do you travel with them frequently? Oh, I've done seven trips with them. Uh, because I traveled alone, I felt very well looked after. I didn't have to worry. Uh, at times, there were people who had medical issues, and they were really looked after well. And if you're a senior, that's also something to consider. Uh, it is an American company, and it is uh, what's the word you used? Oh, I a said senior. Elder Hostel. Elder Hostel. Well, Elder Hostel is actually a place a different thing but it's it's a um and they go all over the world and was again paul if you don't mind if i could just ask mary a little more uh, mm -hmm. so so were you a, a group within a larger cruise or was the whole cruise road scholar no, we were on our, completely on our own and we stayed in uh, like when we arrived in hanoi we stayed in a hotel and um, we went from there on buses to various locations. And then we flew, of course, when we went from Hanoi to Saigon. So it's, you fly if the distance is great, you go by boat, you go by bus, you go by every kind of means of transportation. Thank you. And you do, you do get education plus on your tour. So one of the things that we found out is that the people working on the Viking ship um, were all Cambodian or Vietnamese. 
they were just delighted to have that type of job, which for them, they said, uh, paid them much better than most of the jobs that they were able to get otherwise. So, mm -hmm. and biking, and maybe other companies do the same, certainly give back to the local community. As I said, they had a school that they sponsor and they pay for the education, they provide computers there, computer education, and English education. Two things that they try to make them literate in computer uh, usage and English speaking. Those are the two most important things that allow them to function well later on in their lives. I'd like to ask Richard a bit about his recent uh, polar tour. Um, yes, what would you like to know? <laughs> well, when, when did you go and where, where, where did you go actually? Uh, uh, we went um, in a, around the middle of November, and if Paul again doesn't mind me taking a moment, we were signed up for a cruise which should have. Richard, you went in the middle of August. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah I'm just time traveling a bit here. Uh, middle of <laughs> August, yeah. Um, our cruise should have started at a place called Resolute, which is pretty far north in the Canadian Arctic. And then over about 12 days, it should have slowly cruised through the Arctic across Davis Strait to Greenland and finished in Greenland. But Resolute was choked with ice and the ship could not get in there. Mm -hmm. And so the previous cruise to ours, which should have stopped in Resolute, turned around and went back to Greenland. And so we were flown to Greenland to get on the ship. And then the ship could have, in a sense, gone Greenland to Resolute, but in another sense, it could not because it was booked to end up in Greenland, so it could restart and go up to other places. So we went from Greenland towards the Canadian Arctic, spent a couple of days in Canada after filling out the Arrive Can app and doing all of those things <laughs> which you have to do. Um, and then the ship, instead of continuing to Resolute, which would have given us the itinerary we sort of paid for, but in reverse, it then turned around and went back to Greenland. And um, it was a very interesting trip. We saw things that we would not have seen if we'd done the original itinerary, but we did feel we missed a little bit. And some people on the cruise were actually quite annoyed that they didn't know the itinerary was going to change until they were at the briefing the day before it started. Um, but yeah, I, we, we didn't see a lot of wildlife. Uh, we saw lots of birds, uh, mostly northern fulmars. Um, we had an enormous storm at one point. Uh, when we were returning to Greenland, we were locked in our cabins, fed in our cabins, told it wasn't safe to move about the boat. Um, saw some um, excellent things in Greenland and had a, had a trip we would certainly recommend, although we're not going to do it again. So that's my mini talk on our Arctic cruise. Hoping that you'll give us a proper talk. Well, well, you've already had an excellent talk. Um, the group has had an excellent talk from, remind me, Paul. Um, uh, okay. Right. And, and they did, it was the same company, and they they have done it twice, I think, and gave an, a, a superb talk on it. So I, I don't feel we need to repeat that. Okay. Um, let me see if I can, before we leave, tell you what's coming up. So next uh, talk we have is in October the 20th. We're going to have a double header, as it were. So we have a talk on something called SERVAS, S-E-R-V-A-S. And you can find the information on the Emeritus College website. Uh, John Spinelli is going to talk to us about that. And then Nancy Langton is going to give us a talk about her experience in Laos, staying in the same Southeast Asia region. And in November, November 24th, Uri Asher, is, who is online with us today, he's going to talk to us about his experiences with Rio and Carnival in Rio, specifically. And then uh, we're going to 
have nothing in December because it would come up just before Christmas uh, vacation time and go into January. And you'll find information on the website on what's happening in January. I think in January, I look here, we have Nancy Langton again, she's going to talk about Myanmar. And she's been there a couple of times, she says. So she'll, and she usually shows beautiful photographs in addition to giving a good talk. So we hope that some of you will be able to join us for her talks. Okay. Are there any other uh, questions or comments from anyone before we think about closing? So as usual, I'm always interested in getting uh, um, people, especially people who haven't uh, presented before, to volunteer to give a presentation. As you can see from what's going to happen next week, uh, next month, I should say, we I can try to to fit two smaller presentations together at the same time. Uh, if you say, well, I my presentation won't really take up the whole session. You can give a short presentation on something and we'll try to find a, another short presentation to round out the program. Um, but if you have something you want to talk about, uh, uh, take the whole session, that would be great. We have uh, people who've agreed to talk already into March of 2023. So we're looking for April, May, June, before summer comes. We've got three more slots for the year. Um, so uh, please uh, uh, volunteer if you can. I think a lot of people are starting to travel again. Certainly we have started to travel again. I see Richard has traveled again. We may be able to have presentations that are more up to date than something like I just presented to you, which is from a few years ago. Um, we'll see what uh, you can come up with. Okay. Thank you all for joining us today or joining me today to hear what I had to say about what, for me, was one of my more interesting talk or uh, places to visit. Thank you. Really, really great talk, Paul. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, Richard, thanks for recording. You're welcome. I'm going to end the program.